uh, Winston with us here this evening. Um, and it's particularly relevant what he has to say on transport climate emissions for this region. Statistics, Statistics New Zealand says that 90% of household emissions throughout the country are from transport, but here it's 94%. In car ownership, Wikipedia lists New Zealand as seventh in the world now, but this is only behind oddball countries like Andorra, Monaco and San Marino. But here in this region, we have the highest car ownership in the country, in New Zealand, at 1,000 motor vehicles per 1,000 people. So it's perhaps not surprising then that our per capita emissions are, as a region, the worst in the country at 2.9 tonnes per capita, considerably more than Auckland at two tonnes per capita, and almost double our neighbours over the hill, Marlborough. So if anyone needs help with their transport emissions, it's us. Dr. Paul Winton has a PhD in engineering, a former McKinsey and Company consultant, and a founder of Temple Capital Investment Specialists. But perhaps more relevantly tonight, he is a, or the, founder of 1.5.org.nz, and has produced some very good information about how transport is the key for New Zealand's decarbonisation. He has a fantastic little tool on the 1.5 website, transport2030.org, that invites you to get Auckland's emissions down to its targets. You have various sliders to manipulate, to suggest ways to do it. And it has some big surprises about what's going to work well and what's only marginally effective. Now I'd like to, to hand over to the author of this great work I've mentioned, Dr. Paul Winton. Um, thanks very much for the introduction, Peter. Can anybody hear me all right? Great, thank you. Um, I thought before I embarked on Death by PowerPoint, I could just give you a, a brief, I guess, uh, background into how I ended up doing this stuff. And then I wanted to share the approach I'm going to take this evening. On paper, this is a 30 to 40 minute conversation. Um, it tends to be more closer to the 40 minute mark. Um, and if there are any questions, please do fire them through. This is much better if it's a dialogue rather than a monologue. Um, so to the first bit, uh, how I got into this, my uh, background, I'm an engineer, I've been doing consulting, helping companies figure out whether they should buy or build businesses. Uh, my father um, thought that politically I was right of Genghis Khan, which is, I think, a bit unfair, but it sort of illustrates where he saw the, the role I was playing in the sort of work I was doing. And in 2018, I had, a, I guess, a, a wake-up moment when I realised how serious the biodiversity and climate change thing and, and how little the grown-ups were doing to address that. And I decided I wanted to really commit a good chunk of the next few years to contributing to New Zealand pulling its weight. Um, that became a three and a half year, 60% um, of my time pro bono project. It was originally in the evenings and then the evening snuck into Monday and Monday snuck into Wednesday. And what I want to share with you today is uh, some of the outcomes of that, some of the outputs of that work, but also some of the outcomes of that work, both the outcomes that worked, but also some, <laughs> some of the more shambolic things that were not as effective as, as I might have hoped. Um, and I guess the word, one of the words in the introduction that really resonated in, with this forum is the word community. And, and what has become really, really evident is the need to empower these communities that um, want to do something to make, to be good ancestors. But in many cases are unclear what it is they actually need to do and how they might do it. So a lot of what we'll be talking about today, some of it will be, um, and I, I give these presentations to um, state commercial boards that have never heard of climate change through to School Strike for Climate. So I'll be presenting some material um, that you will have seen before, no doubt, um, those that are interested in climate space. But I want to do that in a way um, in order to share my experience of some of the messages that have worked, that have resonated when I've been talking to people um, to build community, because all of this is about actually building, getting the snowball rolling faster and faster and faster. And clearly you guys have got an amazing snowball already on the side there. So thank you for having me along. Um, so right at the beginning, I will share my screen. I hope technology plays on my side. Okay. Um, right. So I'm going to talk about broadly about climate advocacy and, and I guess the role I've been playing, which is advocacy to activism, depending on you talk about it. And it will have a transport flavour to it. 
But there are three, I guess, three chapters to the conversation. And the first chapter is that in climate change, for, for New Zealand to pull its weight, we'll need to largely decarbonise road transportation by about 2030. And that's different to the narrative that you're hearing from official lines, and I'll explain why that's the case. And in order to get there through advocacy, this requires a small group of people to behave quite differently. And I'll explain who those people are and how we've worked to make them support them to behave differently. And lastly, the next steps. Um, the waters are getting really muddied now um, as the science gets clearer. And I want to talk about how we, in particular in the Auckland landscape, are thinking about what our options are given where the climate change landscape has evolved to uh, in 2023. So first chapter first, how um, New Zealand might pull its weight by largely decarbonising, or the, the fact that, or the view that, we need to largely decarbonise road transportation. So you've probably seen this work from Tim Lenton and friends, um, published originally in 2019 and updated uh, about a year ago. And the reason I share this is because many people, um, those who are not in the five to 10% who think daily about climate change and biodiversity issues, are not abreast of the tipping points um, that we're about to go through. And there was some really wonderful an update on this work published about a year ago that reinforced the punchline here. And the punchline that I share in this is that we're nearing tipping points. The West Antarctic ice shelf to the bottom, uh, we may have already crossed that tipping point. And if not, then we will do so probably over the next five to seven years. That's three metres of sea level rise, which we will not be able to stop within human timeframes. We've had to turn around in 100,000 years, but not in 100 years or 1,000 years. It has a big sister to the north called a Greenland ice shelf that represents about seven metres of sea level rise. And again, that is close to tipping, if not uh, prevailing thinking as it will do so in roughly the next 10 years on the current trajectory. So collectively, we're baking in 10 metres of sea level rise. And here I just ask people to imagine what their beach will look like with that, their favourite beach with that much sea level rise. And, and I think what, what often resonates in this conversation is... Um, the, the scale of that change that is in front of us in the next 10 years and that there's a solid evidence base underneath to support that. And the last one and the one that I, I often find people often come out up to me after presentations and say, man, that was really depressing, is about the Amazon rainforest. And that is, um, unlike the other tipping points, uh, will tip into irreversible decline probably a bit further out, a decade or two further out, but once it do, does so, it will shift to a savanna incredibly quickly on the order of one to two uh, decades. And as the stabilizing force of the entire global climate system, even though it only represents sort of five to seven percent of the oxygen, um, has the sort of consequences that you don't really want to imagine. Um, so the re just to reinforce that, the reason I talk about this is to, to, to highlight the point that actually we are in a rush. And that rush, uh, unlike anything that humankind or has faced before, is something that we need to address at pace um, and at scale. What I then do sometimes, and I'll share, I'll, I'll change the share, is I, I try to bring this down to um, someone's house. And what I do for that is there's a wonderful tool that was published a couple of years ago, and I can share all this with you afterwards. Um, and what it does is, give me two things, let's get the right screen up. Um, what this tool uh, recognized is that, or rather the research behind this tool recognized, is that, can you see my browser now? Yep, thank you. Um, recognized is that estimates of the height of the land had intermingled the height of trees and buildings with the land proper. And as a result of that, the, 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 the average global height of land was actually much lower than had been expected because the, the heights of the adjacent buildings had been thrown up, creating a, an artificial higher level. The punchline from that is that there was hundreds of millions of people that would be flooded much earlier than originally anticipated. And the reason I show this tool is because this tool was then published by those researchers in the States. 
and it allows you to form quite a granular view of what might happen in places that you know about in a reasonable kind of a timeline. So in this case, it's set to land projected to be below a 10-year flood in 2030. Um, you can change the settings on that. You can shift it out to 2080. Um, usually gets more red. Um, you can um, assume that there are no cuts the current tra trajectory. You can assume bad luck. And in doing so, you can start to look and have really constructive conversations about the state of uh, infrastructure, uh, around the state of particular blocks of land, um, and around the, the, the effectively the consequences of what this is going to mean for land and places that people care about. Interestingly, when I go to have this conversation in sort of boardrooms, um, the one of the prevailing messages is um, or questions is, "Can you show me my beach house?" And that's relevant, obviously, to those people because they one have a beach house that's actually on a beach but also it brings it to life uh, for them. So I've found that this has been a really, really useful way of sort of um, informing the conversation. So I'll jump out of that. Um, and by the way, there's a similar tool, uh, which is uh, offered by Niwa, which um, as though that last story were not bad enough, um, also points out that in many cases, the land is sinking as well. Um, so uh, a combination of a bit of rising land, uh, rising sea level and sinking land creates for it an ugly story. So that's how I <clears throat> that's how I tell the story about the science. Um, and then the words, I think the words are important. Now we do have the financial stability, but we have the, the global capital markets are moving in a way which means that uh, investment bankers from Europe are now turning up in coal mines in Western Australia asking how they're decarbonizing. So that the money people have finally turned up. The New Zealand government and Auckland Council as examples have got the paperwork to uh, move us in this direction, the Zero Carbon Act and various council plans. Um, and we're seeing, and we saw the strikes on Friday, the student strikes, um, allowed, but very small, and unfortunately, a body of people that don't vote um, in, the, in the youth cohort, uh, coming along and pushing the words more towards one and a half degrees. So the science, just going back to the previous point, the science is really clear, we shouldn't exceed 1.5 degrees. The words are kind of 1.5 with wiggle room for politicians. Um, and I guess the thing that was really encouraging about the Zero Carbon Act is its opening line. The purpose of the act is to provide a framework by which New Zealand can develop and implement clear and stable climate change policies that contribute to the global effort under the Paris Agreement to limit global average temperature increase to 1.5 degrees above pre-industrial levels. Um, and as though in case one were not clear on whether that actually mattered, further down the same document, the same act that says a person who carries out a duty under this act must carry out that duty in a manner consistent with the purpose of the act, which for many of us was encouraging um, once that act came out. Uh, I'll outline before why it, we, it appears we have a toothless tiger now. Um, and the words, and I, I quickly talk about here, we, we brought research from George Mason and Yale universities down to New Zealand to understand climate sentiment. This is a national survey now, 18 months old. It breaks the country down across 40 questions into six different segments. In the US, it was called Six Americas. It was called Six Australias. It was called, amazingly, the Five Germanies because they didn't have a non-believing segment. Um, but it illustrates where people are at in a continuum of really wanting change, the alarmed on the right hand or left-hand side, and really believing that climate change doesn't exist and that is uh, some sort of a conspiracy created to suck money by scientists normally, uh, to suck money out of the system. So you've got, a, on the right-hand side, you've got Donald Trump, and on the left-hand side, you've got Greta, and, and all the people in between. So what this means, and the reason this matters, is the, the group, like yourselves, that are turning up to meetings on a Monday night are actually quite small. And what's more important in these conversations is getting outside of that bubble uh, and moving towards the concerned, the cautious, and the disengaged, and reaching people that are not in these meetings. And I'll, I'll expand more on that later on. Um, most people don't realize how far we are from the Paris Agreement. Um, current global policies are more like th what, three degrees. And the most recent assessment of New Zealand's performance against other OECD nations is that we are highly insufficient. 
Um, so our um, climate plans as assessed in February of this year were some of the worst in the world. Um, so this is a Zero Carbon Act and all the policies that have been enacted over the following 18 plus months, to, well, it's a long time now, 2019, <laughs> three and a half years um, since that uh, act was first put in place. And again, we hear a narrative through the mainstream media, often from the government or local gov councils, that we're doing great things and this and that and the other. But actually, um, this is a classic example uh, of the emperor having no clothes. And this group here, this is a group of um, NGOs and universities in Europe who assess the policies um, to, to determine where New Zealand's at. And uh, we're a long, long, long way off the pace. And in fact, the, the highly insufficient is consistent with roughly a, a three degrees world. Most people don't realise uh, how far behind the eight ball they are, we are uh, because they are either listening to the mainstream media um, or the Mike Hosking show will sort of move further to the to the right. I, I want to spend a couple of slides talking about why uh, New Zealand currently has um, no uh, climate change legislation in substance. And then I want to talk about what the consequences of that actually are. So uh, the Climate Change Commission um, filed their uh, initial advice to government in uh, what are we now 23, 20, in, uh, early 21 and draft in mid 21 in final form. It proposed a series of budgets. Um, minutes after those final budgets were uh, submitted to government, uh, a group called Lawyers for Climate Action New Zealand that I've been working with over the last couple of years filed a judicial review against the minister, James Shaw, and the Climate Change Commission for effectively failing in their role against the Act. They argued that the advice to government was unlawful. And the reason that matters is because the Ministry for the Environment largely adopted the recommendations of the Climate Change Commission. And subsequent to that, all agencies have subsequently ad adopted it. And in many cases, I'll talk about this later on, um, we have a, a really awkward uh, and inconvenient truth where we have leadership from local councils, and Auckland is an example I know well, uh, being dragged back uh, by the work of the Climate Change Commission, uh, which is why I think what you're proposing is really uh, wonderful, uh, because it sounds like it's more aligned with science. So the reason the Commission um, came to their conclusion and the, the substance of the argument was threefold. Firstly, what are we trying to do? What's the objective of the Act? Secondly, what data sets do you actually use for the trees? And thirdly, a question, did we actually meet the objective? And did we achieve the, the thing that we had set out to do? So uh, the commission don't believe that 1.5 is, uh, they're on the hook for that. They believe that they're on the hook for net zero 2050, excluding biogenic methane, which means you can get there however you want. You can do nothing for 20 years if you want. Conversely, the Kansi argued per the, the uh, purpose of the act that 1.5 actually mattered. And of course, the reason that matters is this is um, one of the key slides out of uh, SR 1.5 2018 report from the IPCC that showed a number of illustrative pathways for emissions reductions. And in all cases, uh, they see very, very steep reductions between now and the blue line now and, and 2050. It is true that net, net zero 2050 is necessary, but it is not sufficient in science speak. And in fact, even the most uh, the slowest pathway, the one on the right-hand side, which allows in the yellow for roughly the same amount of carbon capture and storage devices as we have cars, trucks, and power plants on the planet today, all turned backwards in substance, sucking stuff out of the air, uh, allowed for a very steep curve. So the judge said that while the emissions budget, her view was that the uh, emissions budgets do not have to be consistent with 1.5 pathways, the words contribute to a more consistent with an aspiration and an obligation. So fortunately for, for New Zealand, we're off the hook for 1.5. So the next thing is which data sets to use for the trees. Um, Lackenzie and the Act, in fact, said that we need to use GHG inventory. The Commission um, decided to use modified activity-based accounting, which is used by a grand total of one country in the world, possibly two. And the punchline there is this chart. On the left-hand side, if you use the Commission's maths, you end up with emissions declining slowly over from 1990 to 2030. Um, that's the story they want to tell. 
if conversely you use the international standard GHG inventory, the one specified in the Act, what you see is emissions have and in fact continue to increase over this decade. So this is uh, the affidavit of Dr. William Taylor, which was presented as part of the litigation, um, the judicial review of last year. So all of this is publicly available. I can share it for those who are interested. So the commission doesn't like the idea, uh, it disagrees with the use of UNFCC. Um, however, um, the judge disagreed with our submission, um, the Lackenzie submission, uh, that it required the commission to use UNFCC inventory. She agreed that GHGI net shows that our net emissions will be higher than in any of the three previous decades. So the judge agreed that if we use the international standard and the one specified in the act, our emissions are higher this decade than last decade, which was higher than the decade before. But she said that was okay. And the last is, did we meet the objective? So the commission argued that we should use gross and net. Um, so gross emissions back in 2010 and net emissions in uh, 2030. Uh, Lackenzie proposed using the same method as the IPCC under SR 1.5. Um, the reason that matters is that the in substance, the commission assumed that there were no, no trees in New Zealand in 2010, and I know that there were trees in New Zealand in 2010. And as a result, their emissions were much, much higher than they actually were because the trees were soaking up a lot. So their baseline was 35. And they said, well, to get to 1.5, we've got to pull 49% out. So their CO2 target is 17.9, 18 million tonnes. Conversely, if you use the IPCC methodology, um, you start at 5 million tonnes because there were actually trees in New Zealand in 2010. And your target is 2.6 million tonnes by 2030. So importantly, the um, affidavit, one of the affidavits here was from the lead co-author on 1.5 compliant pathways from the IPCC's SR 1.5, literally the guy who wrote the book. And he said to, that the commission had committed an error in their maths. Um, judge said that that was fine. Um, she accepted the key concern that neither the advice nor the budgets put New Zealand on track to reduce domestic uh, net emissions by 2030 as per the global uh, IPC pathways. She also found that applying IPCC percentage reductions to 2010 gross, and here's a kicker, the commission's advice was potentially misleading, particularly to lady readers or anyone without the time to read the advice or 200 pages in its full detail to the extent that it could be interpreted as advice that reductions of 36% below 2005 gross levels would be compatible with 1.5 pathways and therefore the 1.5 global effort. So um, the judge basically said that's fine, just assume there's no trees in 2010. Um, and if you add all those things up, or the other thing that was just, just for entertainment's sake I include here is that um, Casey, which was the then QC, now Casey, who argued the case, um, argued that if, if the commission was forced to use net-net comparisons to compare its advice to the IPCC pathways, i.e. to use the correct maths, then they would simply be unsuitable and it would simply decide not to use the IPCC work, which is amazing. <laughs> like, if you're not going to use the IPCC, well, I wonder what you're going to use. Anyway, that that was the, it illustrated to my mind the sort of the underlying thinking that was going on behind that. And the reason all this matters, to come back to maths, is if you believe the Commission's maths, then the target reduction in coal, gas, petrol, and diesel by 2030 versus 2019 is about 25%. If you believe the maths that Lackenzie argued, if you believe there were trees in 2010, if you believe that 1.5 matters, and if you believe that you shouldn't use, make the same error that the commission did, then we need to reduce coal, gas, petrol, and diesel by 2030 versus, uh, by, versus by 2030 by about 75%. Now, if you're going to keep some of the big things, uh, then the bigger matters, then you start to go into the other stuff. And what that means is probably transport will end up carrying even more of the load. So you, your maths quickly leads you to a scenario where transport needs to reduce by north of 75%. Uh, 
Um, I'll, I'll carry on in the interest of time. I'm sort of, I think I'm about 20 minutes into, 20-ish minutes into this. No questions, Peter, right now? Okay. Um, uh, so in the introduction, Peter made reference to uh, a tool. Uh, so in 2020, um, I did a piece of work and analysis on how New Zealand might pull its weight to deliver on a 1.5 future. And what became very clear when filtering by technology, economics, politics, and the emergent law was that a lot of the heavy lifting would have to be carried by uh, transport. So reducing the cows was always going to be hard politically, technically, and also there's some $50 billion worth of debt associated with agriculture. Um, emissions associated, some of the industries are very hard to decarbonize. Um, for example, aluminium, um, methanex in, um, down in uh, New Plymouth. Um, the uh, aviation, very hard to decarbonize in that kind of timeline as well, short of not flying, which is a great idea. Um, so you end up with, you know, I ended up with a conclusion that we needed to largely decarbonize road transportation. And in order to do that, that wasn't obvious how that would happen. So I undertook some analysis on how we might decarbonize road transportation, uh, particularly in, New in Auckland, uh, an area that I knew and where we had a very politically permissive environment at the time. Um, and I, I tested that with a group called MR Cagney in late uh, 2019. I tested it two or three times and they, after the third meeting, they, they accepted that they couldn't see a flaw in the logic, but also that the punchline couldn't be true. And the punchline was, hey guys, after we spend $35 billion in transport over the next 10 years in Auckland, our emissions will be roughly 20% higher. So even though we've got a new train set, even though we've got um, the CRL, the underground rail is coming in, blah, blah, blah. So that was sort of arguably the most knowledgeable actors within the ecosystem. And the reason I highlight this is in many cases, the people that should know don't. Um, they haven't had the time, the chance to think it through um, and or there have been forces against them that have prevented them either doing the work or sharing the work. So MR Cagney went away and... Um, they stress tested it. They set up a small team to stress test and they came back to me early 2020, sort of just before COVID hit. And they said, we'd hoped you'd missed a zero on your maths call, but actually it's pretty much bang on and no one knows this. Um, and with your blessing, we'd like to put this on the web and use it as a discussion tool. Um, it became one of my critical, most important discussion tools that I shared with all of the key actors who I'll talk to talk about in a moment. I shared with the prime minister, with cabinet on several occasions. Um, and it allowed me to have a conversation which went something like, these are the things that really matter. And these are the things that are interesting here and light, but I'm not going to move the dial. So what I'll do is I'll, I'll run you through the Auckland version of that um, quickly. Um, and I should, should take, if I get my maths right, it should take about two or three minutes. Um, just to illustrate what this looked like. And then I'll talk about how you can do that in your neighbourhood. Uh, so on here you should be able to see uh, Transport 2030 it's been done in this format for both Auckland and Victoria of all places first Auckland um, and what it considers is on the right hand side on the top is the emissions in Auckland associated with moving around so it's not uh, freight and 2018 is a baseline year and then in 20. 30 um, as a baseline, assuming just population growth and moving around roughly as we do today. Um, it also considers on the extreme right hand side a scenario builder, which goes up and down depending on which policies you choose to accept. And on the bottom right, we have a congestion ometer, uh, which is a proxy for cars on the road. Cars on the road is a proxy for congestion, rather. So the first thing I do is I show what our current plan is. The current plan is spending about $35 billion worth of stuff. Um, we put in place the city rail link. And so what you'll see is this right-hand bar will move. The city rail link for, pick a number, about another $5 billion. Once complete and once full, um, reduces our emissions by a really little amount. 
We then talk about the two light rail projects. There's only one on the table at the moment. They're probably north of 30 billion, but let's just say the lowest number, 15 billion we put in. We turn those two on. Let's assume they're both built by 2030 and they're full. Um, and what we find is that we're still like a million miles north of where we were. So that the narrative that had been in play right up to the boards of the decision makers was we're rolling out a train set and we're rolling out this light rail and it'll be awesome afterwards. And when you do the maths, you find out actually it won't be awesome because this doesn't even consider embedded emissions. There were a number of other projects which are in many cases good projects. Um, there was a cycling investment plan which had roughly six times payback per infrastructure spend versus the other things. Um, there was a very small change in electrification anticipated by um, electrifying the fleet. And there was uh, a proposal to electrify some buses, incremental buses from about 2023. So that was the plan uh, of, of about two years ago uh, after $35 billion was spent. And um, so the, the decision makers did not know this. And I um, started sharing this and then I shared an alternative view of the future. And that alternative view of the future said, well, rather than spending all that money, let's not, let's actually give $35 billion back to the community for a Google. It does mean that we end up with half a tunnel, but for the exercise here, let's do that. So the first thing we did is we said, let's actually reduce the number of trips. Let's do work from home. Let's go to the supermarket less often. Let's just travel out there less often, less trips. And a 10% reduction in the trips. So if you do 20 trips a week, do 18, um, has more imp impact, that one thing, than $30 billion worth of investment. If you also choose to live more local. Now, in Auckland, we have this problem where we set up malls at the end of motorways, a long way away from anyone with massive parking lots. And what that does is it kills local business, kills communities, and kills the opportunity to live local. If you just reduce the average trip length from about, I think it's about 11 kilometers to about 10, um, then that alone gets you back to where uh, you were by 2030. So less sprawl. Do not allow your city to sprawl so up rather than out. Um, and build communities, build businesses locally. If you then get serious about cycling, so levels of cycling of Copenhagen, um, that's roughly 10 times what we have in Auckland. Uh, it's very doable. I'll show how in a moment. Um, you electrify all the buses from now. It actually doesn't really matter because the buses are a tiny contributing factor. And you get serious about car emissions. You stop Hiluxes coming into your, your town. If you need a Hilux, great, buy one. If you don't need a Hilux, then use something else. And what you see is if you actually get to where in New Zealand's average, to where the average new car in Japan was in 2014 by 2030, then it does that. And, and this is because New Zealand is one of only two countries in the world that has not until recently had any emission standard. So emit whatever you want. On top of that, we can get serious about electrification. So that's the last thing in the stack. And, and where that gets you to is down to about a 65% reduction in your emissions. By the time you get to that point, the oil and gas sector is in a death spiral. It makes its money off selling petrol and adjacent pies and moro bars. If it's not selling those, then that the end of that industry goes into a death It cannot support it itself. So once we pass the threshold, the oil and gas industry will collapse. So the, the, there is also, conveniently, a Nelson version of that, um, a Melbourne Nelson Tasman version of that. And I'll share that with you afterwards. Um, and I would strongly suggest that your communities work on figuring out how to tell that story um, and use that as a tool to tell that story to the people who need to be told. The chances are they won't know. So push on, I've got a few more slides. Um, so here I talked about the disconnect between the regions and those that are displaying leadership versus the central government. On the left-hand side, you can see reductions as proposed by the Climate Change Commission by sector. On the right-hand side, you can see what's come out of the Auckland Council Climate Plan of 2020. So agriculture, 10% nationally, 15% in Auckland. It doesn't really matter. There's only about eight cows here, so it's not politically hard. 
stationary energy is roughly double uh, the national target. But the real kicker is transport. So the Climate Change Commission proposed a 6% reduction versus 2019, whereas Auckland has embraced a 64% reduction by, uh, by 2030. IPPU and waste are very similar numbers. And the punchline down the bottom is that the Commission's reductions in gross are 16%, whereas Auckland Council has 50%. And you will have heard the 50% by 2030 story. So um, Auckland's actually delivering through its C40s initiative as on that aspiration. And what we identified, I guess what I identified earlier, is that there are about 40 decision makers that matter. And so this is now dated. Um, there are many of the people that were on here who have um, since left. Um, but we, I initially, but subsequently we, targeted these decision makers to ensure firstly that they understood the story that I'd shared before, what matters. And secondly, um, that they felt supported to make those decisions if they wanted to do so. And if they didn't, they felt pressured. And so what that meant in practice is that I ended up in a effectively a spare time lobbying project, um, running the work that one-on-one uh, -on -one and one-on-a few sessions in front of all of these people. Um, the only person who actually knew this of those 40 people was Shane Allison, the CEO of AT. Everybody else was blissfully unaware. So again, I'll reinforce that point that don't assume that the decision makers know this stuff. They probably don't. And over time, what we did is we built support and we built community around this. So I built a community within the media. Stuff was the first cab off the rank. Um, Eloise Gibson, they've done some wonderful work. I worked with Mark Dolder. I worked with all of those people who were showing leadership, leadership within the media and supported them to tell the stories they needed to tell. I also built <coughs> an audience of technical supporters, influential climate voices and influential non-experts in climate. Uh, in order to convey that same message. So it was the intent was to build the build the, the loud hailer. And, and where that all came together is in 2020, um, with the blessing of Lacanzi, um, who supported who presented with me, and a Lucy Lawless of all people, we brought together a who's who of the climate communities in Auckland. And we formed what became known as All Aboard Aotearoa. It was originally All Aboard Auckland. And the purpose of that group was. Uh, sixfold. But in short, it was to decarbonize road transportation in Auckland by 2030. We had six key actions, climate and equity had to be at the front, improve, improve, improve proximity, reducing traffic volumes, um, prioritize active and public transport, reduce and decarbonize the fleet, and stay true to the treaty. And they stayed within the core of and have done for the last three years. Um, that community, which comprises really everybody who matters in the Auckland um, in the Auckland uh, climate space. And what that meant is that we managed to, in August of last year, get the TERP across the Transport Emission Reduction Pathway. Um, it is a council adopted plan uh, that sees 64% less transport emissions by 2030, so 64% less petrol and diesel. Um, it shows the business as usual pathway, the one I talked about before, Pardon me, they had a baseline where they tweaked some numbers, so they sort of snuck just below the 20, uh, 2019 numbers. And then they had the actual pathway. And that actual pathway looks something like this. Um, so against the baseline, you see massive increases in sustainable modes by trip share and mode share across walking, cycling, and uh, public transport. I'm not going to go into the details of this now. But for example, um, cycling, you see an increase in trip share from 1% to 17%. And to put numbers to that in Auckland, we're currently rolling out somewhere between 5 and 10 kilometres of cycle lanes a year. It's supposed to be more, but we're struggling with that. To deliver on this, we need to be delivering about 150 kilometres of cycle lanes a year-ish. Um, and that would start, that would by 2030, uh, put us on track with European nations. Um, and the awesome thing about that is it's actually very doable with the existing infrastructure and can be done um, by reallocating existing infrastructure, most notably, um, and this is a politically hard bit, reallocating existing parking uh, to, our, to allow free passage for buses and safe passage for kids and families, effectively opening streets that have been closed to the public because of cars for a long time. Um, I won't go into that. We do decarbonize the fleet, but what's more important, we actually, this is uh, vehicle kilometers traveled. 
So in a vehicle, so on the left-hand side, the projected 2030 pathway uh, is VKT, about 17 billion VKT. Under the plan, uh, it's about 6 billion. So it's more than halving the number of kilometers that are traveled in a light vehicle by 2030. And in doing so, and, and also um, where there is a car, it's much more electric than it is today. So that leads to a 75% reduction in diesel, uh, diesel and petrol liters by 2030. Uh, and transport fuel, I won't go into that. There is a, a big plan behind it. You've got to have a camp somewhere. So uh, again, that's in the plan. Um, but we're, so that was great, but we're now starting to see the dysfunctional behavior. We had a very politically permissive um, council for six years, and we've now rated, ro ro rolled into the Wayne Brown years, which less, look less supportive to that. Um, we've also seen the council um, adopt climate plans that are counter to their own climate plan, amazingly, or transport plans. Um, and as a result, we took them to court. Uh, we lost, but that's an appeal uh, again. Um, and also at a, at a national level, I mean, after um, um, Minister Michael Wood was going to uh, roll out a pro program much more favourable to sustainable transport, and he got um, shot down uh, by Chris Hipkins, who decided that uh, emissions was no longer going to be transport's main priority, uh, that resilience and recovery was going to be that, which is a euphemism for road building. Um, and lastly, so uh, two more slides. The, the waters, are, waters are muddied now. The science is getting clearer and clearer. It has been for a long time. But where we influence next, and in Auckland, what we observed is um, this amazing and, and would be comical were it not so serious, finger pointing exercise between Auckland Transport, Central Government, Waka Kotahi and Council. And I would sit down with a minister, uh, Michael Wood, and he would say with his most earnest voice, Paul, I really want to do this, but all the balls are in council's court. And you'd go and talk to the mayor or you talk to the council and they'd go, I would love to do this, but central government, they're just not leading us. And you talk to AT, and AT would come. And I don't know that they ever actually got in the same room together, but it was quite amazing the dysfunction that was happening both within those organisations at the senior level um, but also between them. Um, out of all of these actors, interestingly, the one that I would consider to be the leader is Auckland Council. Auckland Council has gone through and created a 1.5 compliant plan. So I've turned that into a detailed transport plan and then now we'll run into the Wayne Brown treacle. It remains to be seen how that plays out. Um, so there, are, there have been leaders and laggards. Um, and I, I won't go into the details, but I think it, it, it warrants really understanding who your leaders and who you're, and I, I think you need, someone needs a list of people that make decisions on the wall and they need to understand where each of those people actually are. Um, and they need to support those, actively support those that need this because they'll be making tough political decisions and they need to provide consistent, unbearable pressure on those that are opposing this change. And that happens both around election time, but actually all the time. And bringing communities together, bringing kids together, bringing schools together, bringing all of these people together to share their voices. For example, telling the decision makers that we actually want safe passage to, for our kids to ride to school without being hit by a truck. That's not an unreasonable request. And if we're going to continue allowing big vehicles, bigger and bigger ve and higher emitting vehicles to dominate the roadways, that's simply not possible. So... What next? We're still thinking what next in Auckland. We have a really, really strong community here. Um, I have been approached and by many, many philanthropists desperate to give us more money to push forward on this. Uh, we are still trying to figure out what next. The three big league pathways that we're considering is shifting mainstream sentiment um, or support for politicians. That's true. So building uh, support for these actions. It's also hard and long. Um, you need to slowly drag the population on. And the one thing I'd suggest here is that your next meeting should be with the same number of people who don't know about climate change. And have a conversation like this with those people and bring them up to speed with us and make them part of the movement. And it's really about moving, building the movement and around building the uh, 
what a socially acceptable pathway for politicians looks like. Um, civil disobedience, I had dinner with Jay, Jonathan, Sir Jonathan Porritt uh, a while back, and his view, he's uh, one of the co-founders of the Green Party in the UK, he's an advisor to Air New Zealand, and um, his father, I think, was um, in politics here many, many years ago. Uh, his view, and that's shared in his book that is public, is that actually civil disobedience is the only way that we're going to get through this. Whether it's Extinction Rebellion or many of the other, I don't think that the techniques have been fully refined yet, um, but it is clear that in many changes that society has seen, uh, it has been as a result of people uh, standing up in ways that were counter to the law of the day. And that brings us to the third tool is legal pathways. So thus far, the legal system has, including the laws, have failed us. So we have been through four significant judicial reviews and all of those reviews have in short said, carry on polluting, no obligations at all to hit 1.5. Um, one could argue that that is because the laws are wrong. Uh, one could argue that's because we have a judiciary that on the day fell that way. Um, or one could argue that actually we're not thinking creatively enough about the laws. And I've heard all of those arguments. But at the moment, the, the legal pathway and consistent legal pressure on these entities remains one of the really important tools. We haven't delivered on it successfully yet in New Zealand, though there's really good precedent internationally for this making, uh, for good progress being made. Um, so with that monologue, I'll pause and um, hand back to you, Peter, and to see whether there's any questions or comments. Sure. Thanks, Paul. That's, that's fantastic. Um... Yeah. Um, well, I, I yeah, I had one. Of them. <clears throat> Did you model congestion charging? It's a small thing, but um, you know, does congestion charging move the dial? Or is it um... congestion charging has been shown internationally to be a very good tool at uh, moving uh, traffic volumes out of a place? Uh, it does need to be done equitably, and in practice, that means that. There are many who believe it needs to be done equitably, and in order to do that, there need to be alternatives for those who are moving in. That doesn't mean you need to build big infrastructure. In practice, that means that in parallel to putting those things in place, you need to reallocate existing roading infrastructure to allow for uh, buses, including micro buses, and active mobility, mobility bikes, e-bikes, and scooters. Cool. Thank you. Uh, a couple of questions here, Paul. Any guidelines on the emission impacts of population growth? Just how that might affect? Yeah, I mean, so, so in general, population growth in New Zealand is not a massive driver um, compared to the scale of change. So if you believe the maths I've put forward, then we need to reduce our emissions by, call it 75%, 80%, 90% in CO2 over the next seven years, so 10% a year, linear-ish. Uh, population might grow 10% over that period, so it's a second-order impact versus that. What is, however, more impactful is where that population grows. So in Auckland, we uh, have many places we've had a battle between the up and the out, the heritage versus character versus higher-density actors. Um, as the game is being played out today, um, that is favouring more of an up policy, um, and which is what the rest of the world has done, uh, which seems to work. Um, an out policy uh, is politically uh, supported by some nationals come out with their recent policy, which uh, supports sprawl. And um, sprawl, if I put numbers to that, in Auckland, um, sprawl alone, uh, was going to add 8% to emissions by 2030. So it actually adds more than population growth just by increasing the distances that people travel. Thank you. Um, all right. Um, you mentioned about getting people in the room. Um, can you speak to your experiences, successes about getting um, people in? in together in the room who don't understand climate change? Yeah, so I, I, there is a cohort and it's reflected in that segmentation who believe that climate change is real, believe that it's serious, 
um, believe it needs to be addressed and don't know what they can do and they've got to make dinner for the kids again tonight and they're late for this. And so they're, they're keen to do something, but that action needs to be made really easy to them. So what is really what we've found useful is um, to run sessions with community-minded groups that are adjacent to our own groups, scout groups or sport groups or other groups that are interested in hearing it and presenting that story in a way that resonates for them uh, and, and also gives them, empowers them to do stuff. Um, and if we think about what that empowerment is, the, you know, it, it is important to make one's own changes, but in transport, these are primarily system level changes that are needed. So the tools that we have are voting, haranguing and supporting politicians, and getting other actors to harangue and support politicians. So for example, recently uh, in Auckland, we have had a couple of cycleways that were to be rolled out. Some of the new politicians decided that cycleways are dumb, that no one ever uses them. Um, so we pulled together all of the schools in the neighbourhood, um, the boards and the CEOs, to write a letter to said state politician and make it clear that the kids actually want this, the schools want this, and the parents want this. So the way we in, in that case, it was through the schools that we had those conversations. They didn't know about climate change. They didn't know the cycle way had a material impact on climate change, but we were able to bring them up to speed on that focused area and give them a thing that they could do right now that would contribute to the story. Great, thank you. Okay, um, a question here, given your data, can we trust the Climate Commission's work, messages, projections at all? It's a, it's a really good question, and it's one I struggle with a little bit. I, I think that the individuals who are in there are high-integrity individuals who are wanting to do the best thing. Um, I think that the message that they, Dr Rod Carr, for example, is conveying around the need for New Zealand to move more quickly in um, the spirit of those messages absolutely on message. Um, that said, I don't bother reading the Commission's work anymore because the uh, maths that they put forward is, in my opinion, just fundamental, and the opinion of leading scientists fundamentally flawed and reflects a um, a view on climate that is not consistent with the rate, and cha rate of change that the IPCC says we need to move at. So I, I, I think it's great that they carry on saying that message. And one of the things, for example, that we will soon be doing um, under the philanthropic work is putting up an alternative climate change commission plan, uh -huh. one that is true to um, that recognises there were trees in 2010 um, that does respect the GHG protocol and that um, is consistent with 1.5 degrees, at least a, a, a subjective view. I mean, it's always a question about what each country uh, is on the hook for. But at the very, given that we're a higher matter per, per capita and one of the historically highest, if not the highest emitters per capita in the world, um, then there's a compelling story for us doing more than average. Um, that's great. Look, we've got another speaker and we, we, we have still got some more questions coming up, but um, I just would quite like to move on to the next speaker and then come back to questions after that, if, if that's all right. Are you okay with that, um, Robin? Yeah. So um, don't go away, Paul. If you can just hang on for 10 minutes, it'd be great. Um, so I'd, I'd just like to introduce the, um, the next speaker, um, who's Jane Murray from um, Tasman District Council's transport team. Um, Jane previously worked for the DHB on preventative health and the implications for various transport choices that people make, partly or fully because local and national governments have made them the most um, attractive, if not the only viable option for most people. I find it interesting to note that the health benefits of virtually every single transport initiative that we might suggest for climate change um, also has you know um, good health benefits, but those um, are really taken into account into cost and cost benefit calculations and transport projects. Be it getting more physical exercise in the open air by doing the daily commute on a bike or even walking from um, to and from the bus stops instead of just to your garage and back. And although we don't have any, anybody here from Nelson City Council's transport team tonight, I'm sure Jane will be able to tell us. Um, about some of the joint ventures planned for Nelson, as well as TDC's own plans. So Jane, over to you. 
Thank you very much. Um, I'll just start sharing my screen. Is that working, Peter? Yeah. Oh, great. Fantastic. Thank you very much, everyone, for your time. Um, Ko Jane Murray um, Toku Ingo. I have been at Tasman District Council um, since February, so I'm very new um, to working in the council space, but I've been working for public health units down in Canterbury and in Nelson, being a big advocate for um, active and public transport for some time. Um, and a few years ago, I was really fortunate to be able to spend half a day with um, Lucy Saunders, who is responsible for um, Healthy Street Indicators. She is, uh, if you haven't um, heard of her before, she is a public health physician who was hired by Transport for London um, to create a way of assessing streets on and looking at what attributes uh, um, they're giving to, to help people in looking at is it clean air, are the roads easy to cross, is everyone welcome, is there shade, um, shelter, things to do, what makes it a great street? Um, and this, her work has really inspired me and, and um, this is the type of thing I'm hoping to bring with me as part of my papa to, to work um, in the council transportation space. So I know from Paul's wonderful presentation that I cannot start um, a presentation by saying, we're doing really, really great things. Um, <laughs> as a, um, but I do wanna talk about some of the um, projects we are working towards. There is a lot waiting in the wings um, and it will be rolled out this year. And let me start by um, talking about some of the work um, that my predecessors um, worked on last year, which was walking and cycling strategy. And within this strategy, it had really high targets we were trying to achieve for um, making walking and cycling journeys. Um, when we look at Tasman towns, they are quite small towns. They're, they're not big places to get across. So we're trying to encourage a lot more um, journeys by walking and cycling. And by um, releasing this document last year, we've been able to tap into a lot of um, a lot of government funding, um, which we may not have been able to um, get otherwise. So, in some of these projects, may have taken longer to get on the ground. I'll talk to talk about one of the ones that you may have seen on the street so far. Um, so, we've got this one of the projects is our streets for um, people project, where um, we are looking at putting cycleways throughout Richmond, and we're looking at, we started off by looking at the school area. Um, we're also doing some intersection improvements, um, all the improvements are happening on bus routes. We're working um, within, uh, with different um, community groups. So we're um, trying to tap into the schools, um, to cycle advocacy groups, the local neighbours, and also the local politicians are attending these um, workshops as well. Um, sorry, this slide is slightly dated because we did do a big survey. Um, we'll be doing um, pre-surveys on the areas we're working on and post-surveys. So I'll um, show you, a, this is a map of Richmond. Um, this, so this has come out of the walking and cycling strategy and it's showing you the key, this is the key project areas for Richmond. Um, and you've probably seen um, on the ground um, Salisbury Road, we've got the new cycleway put in and we've also got a project starting in Mapua. We've, um, we've had a series of workshops and the work on the ground is coming up in the next couple of months. In terms of um, in terms of our Streets for People Richmond project, just for Salisbury Road, hopefully um, it's not, the font's not too small, but we um, we started off by asking people, do you think this um, do, do you think the speed in the project area? Um, how do you feel about the speed in the project area for those not in vehicles? How how do you feel? It, the areas for school children and for those elderly. And it was actually quite interesting results 
before we did anything on that road, um, we, sorry, I wasn't very good with um, some of my cutting and pasting on this. Um, before we did it, it was 23, 22% uh, felt it was very safe, whereas it was about 35% of people saying it, it was actually either very unsafe or unsafe. Whereas after, um, we're getting to see a shift where people are finding that new cycleway a lot more safe um, to use. Um, I'm going to talk switch hats slightly because we've got we were able to get two um, pools of money. We've tapped we managed to get Waka Katahi's Streets for People money, and we also tapped into um, some funding from the Climate um, Emergency Response Funding. So. And we've got a few projects that are working in conjunction with each other. So, and these transport choices projects tend to be more about the intersections. Um, and also we're, we're looking at bus shelters and, and um, seats and bike racks as well. And if I flick onto this map, this, will, this map hopefully, again, not too small, but this shows you all the projects we're working on in the Richmond space at the moment. So um, I'll just use my mouse to, to drive around. We've got Salisbury Road that's in the ground at the moment. For all of these projects, we've got to get them in the ground by um, June next year. So we're looking at putting a cycleway all along Salisbury Road, which will also connect up with another, um, extending the cycleway and shared space. Um, we've got a lot of complexities around the top of Wensley Road. It's incredibly narrow. It's not a great place to retrofit and a new bus service that will be running down the street as well. So we've got to allow for multiple uses. We're also on here um, was indicating different um, cross um, intersection improvements as well. So that so this will create a, a kind of a spine across Richmond. In conjunction to that is another cycleway that's running parallel at the top of um, Hill Street. And we've also got a large, if you're not familiar with Richmond, we've got a large school precinct right, right here with Waimea College, Waimea Intermediate, Henley School, um, St. Paul's, the Catholic School, uh, Salisbury School, and uh, Akura as well. So because it's such a big school zone, we've got another um, site project going along um, William Street, and there's um, some raised crossings along the street as well. Um, we've got our other primary school is down um, over by the town centre, down by Church Street, and that's there's a wee project trying to link with the new subdivisions um, that have been built in Berry Fields. So there's a lot happening around the district, especially Richmond. There's a, um, a company um, projects um, that are happening in Mapua. Um, and you may have seen that we're also um, in conversations with the Motueka community about um, different safety improvements along High Street and around the schools, looking at how we can keep our um, Tamariki safe as they are going to and from school. Um, and there's some town improvements in Motueka. Um, so that's the that's the um, that's a, a quick overview of what's happening in the active transport. We've also got a you're probably aware of the big changes for our new bus fleet, which is now going from in bus to e bus and all the new buses that were coming, the photos there of them being loaded up in China and the, all the buses are electric and are arriving shortly into the country. Um, so the 1st of August, our prices were are reducing to flat $2 fares if for adults. And of course, that's going to be $1 fare if you're under 25. And then I think it was free from 12 just need to double check that one um, uh, for children. 
So, and then the, the urban buses are, are running at more frequently. Um, there's simplified routes. We're extending them out to um, Wakefield. Wakefield will have a bus service um, six times a day and Mapua will have one. Uh, Mapua and Motueka and Tasman will have one um, four times a day. Um, there's a bus service that will service the airport. Um, that will also tr travel over the hills and towards the brook, and um, people can cha change. Um, we'll go to the brook, um, and then people can change if they wanted to go to Richmond at the Tahuna hub. Um, then we're also working on digital displays and more um, bus stops. Um, so there's a raft of stuff that's going to be coming out about the new buses in the next couple of months. And finally, um, we are also working on our speed management plan. So across New Zealand, um, all councils need to have a 10-year speed management plan. This is looking at the um, speed limits in urban areas and in rural areas with specific um, attention given to the schools. Um, and we were going to be working with the school communities as well. Um, we started to work with our elected officials about what um, this, uh, different speed management plan might look like for the Nelson Tasman area. It, it will be a joint plan between Nelson and Tasman um, and expect consultation about that to come out in August or September. And last thing um, I wanted to touch on today is our 10 year plan. So we're in the middle of doing our um, 30 year infrastructure plans and a 10 year plan. So now is the opportunity to come if you haven't done already, and I know many of you already have, and thank you so much for your comments, um, but if you haven't, we do have the opportunity to hear, to um, pop in, think about what issues are really important to you, and we'll get, we want to hear your ideas. So whatever you can give us um, is fantastic. But thank you very much. You're on mute, Peter. Can you stop sharing your screen? Um, oh, sorry. Yes, of course. Cool. Okay. Well, um, thanks for that. That was fantastic. Bring us um, down to a local um, um, initiative. Paul, do you have any comments? Do you have any comments? Got one little thing, Peter, if, if I may, um, just on Nelson. Nelson also got funding um, for their transport, um, um, trans transport choices and for streets for people. So they're, they're looking at, I think it's called the East-West Link. So Nelson has a lot of um, cycleways that are going to the north-south, but it's the connection through the Polytech, through the hospital and through to the... Um, railway reserves so that's a, 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 piece, a missing piece of the puzzle which um, they'll be working on also within the next 12 months. Thanks Jane. Paul um, it seems to me that this um, these initiatives seem so small in comparison to what we really need but um, do you have any comments on well, I think in general they they look excellent I mean these are case studies or examples of um, the kinds of changes that need to be made and in, in doing these it's possible to identify the, the impediments to doing it. I'm sure that many of these things have not gone through smoothly so you sort of roll, you identify what the risks to delivery are. Um, the, uh, the, the two other comments I'd make is I'm delighted that public health is that you've moved across from there into this space. It's so wonderful to see that lens rather than the um, I, I love the smell of hot tarmac sort of group that often end up in those roles. Um, and I, I think that I guess the question I would ask is how many of those projects actually need to be delivered at what rate in order to achieve some sort of a target? And let's say it's a 75% reduction in petrol and diesel by 70 by 2030. Um, do you need five times that, 10 times that, a hundred times that? And I think that's a useful exercise to go through just to understand where the where the region's on that journey. Um, and the, one of the reasons I say that is the politicians 
are incredibly good at pointing to the two electric buses they've got and taking a photo opportunity whilst ignoring the 1300 diesel buses that have just been bought and will be running for the next 20 years. I think the, the risk is that, the, the, is that these good, really good stories are highlighted as being the solution when the scale and rate of change is not actually what's needed. Uh, thank you for that, Paul. Joanna, would you like to ask your question uh, about pushback and how to deal with that? Certainly, I would. Um, Paul, re recently in Nelson and Tasman, I've observed pushback developing against displacing parking, parking spots with cycle lanes. And it's starting to look quite serious. Uh, I wonder if you have any, uh, th th this is fairly recent for us. We, I, I don't think we have a lot of experience in, in responding to this. And I would appreciate any advice you might give us uh, on dealing with, with this pushback. Yeah, so there's two, two things um, I've observed here. One is, it's really useful just to have the evidence base behind the changes uh, that are being advocated. So for example, one of the areas that's often argued is if you put a cycle lane past my shop, no one will come here anymore. I no one where to park here. Now the evidence doesn't support that argument. And in fact, in many cases, at least in the nearby uh, suburbs in Auckland, um, the perception of how people get to their shops is wildly different to how people actually get to their shops. Um, so there's, there's a really useful evidence part to it, but evidence only had, that I've only had about 3% of the population, but it's useful to know that anyway and to have that in your back pocket. And the other side that we've found is um, mobilisation of uh, low adjacent communities. So schools and other businesses are the two in, in particular. And Tay Road was a good example in Auckland where there was initially widespread opposition, but then following literally a door knocking exercise all the way down the street with kind of a compelling evidence base, um, that switched around completely and gained lots of support because those people could see why actually it's easier to park outside their shop. Um, people, you know, There's more people going by, by et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So I, I think they're the two observations. Made. How to fix it, I think it remains a risk. It's a risk, but I mentioned that just a month ago we were having to cobble together lots and lots of communities to get through to one tipping point politician who was going to vote down cycleways uh, because it was going to require parks to be taken out. And um, that's just the landscape wrap and unfortunately. Thank you very much. It's very helpful. Um, excuse me, Robin. Um, would you mind if um, Drew Bryant also spoke. Um, Drew works for Nelson City Council. He's has been sick this week and has had laryngitis, but he he may be able to say a few words about um, Nelson's transport projects, which I've may have missed. Um, yeah, thank you, Jane and Drew. I'm I'm just conscious that we we have got very little time left and still quite a few questions. Um, one of the things I was thinking about as a, as a follow up to this, if people are interested, is, is to continuing the conversation um, now that Paul has primed us with the necessity for it and lots of ideas about it. So I don't know, what do you think there, Peter? Um, could, we, could we just ask Paul a couple more questions, perhaps? Well, you know, a busy man, Paul, but um, there's some, some questions here about banning private car travel in cities. And um, I'd also add to that about tradable emission um, quotas. I don't know. If, um, so it's essentially rationing fossil fuel um, per capita that you get us um, saleable. Uh, so what was the question about? What was the first of those questions about banning? Sorry, what about banning private, private car travel in cities? Uh, yeah, banning is, I mean, that would be wonderful. It's a, um, it's a big stick yeah. um, and it's a politically big stick. So, 
is congestions that charging has ended up being a substitute that's been um, shown to be effective when it's been rolled out well. Um, and there are ways of, um, I mean, there are parallels to smoking cessation um, here where um, uh, first you weren't allowed to smoke in a bar and then you weren't allowed to smoke in the footpath and then these packet of cigarettes went up a little bit. So sort of chopping off the spaces and the times and et cetera, et cetera. I think we can learn a lot from public health and the way it's managed many of those risks over the years and, and making things sort of increasingly inconvenient with, for one group of actors or one behaviour type. Um, so I think my, my, I haven't heard of banning as being a, as a, an absolute tool being taken very seriously by anybody, but um, many of the other things are functionally very, very similar. So, so what about the, the second part that I added on about trade or emission um, quotas? Or... That sounded wonderfully technical. Could you maybe expand on that question? Um, yeah, so that um, people would be issued like a ration of um, fossil fuel emissions that were tradable so that if you didn't use much in the way of fossil fuels, you could sell your quota um, to people who need well, need. Um, want to use more? Uh, so I haven't heard of that construct before. Um, I'd be making stuff up on the fly. I mean, it's it sounds like an interesting, an interesting model. I guess it starts to run up against the ETS and other schools that are another tool rather that are seeking to do the same thing, albeit through business. Thank you. I think the thought is that. Um, that hasn't been very successful. So looking for the ETS hasn't been very successful. So looking for other models, but we can certainly get more information to you about it. And um, just got a question here, if you could comment on the, uh, we've got relativity of switching ICE cars to EVs versus switching to, you know, getting people onto buses, presumably yeah. electric buses just in terms of reducing emissions yeah so um ice cars to ev is uh good for emissions um well it's good for emissions long term it doesn't help a congestion problem and it doesn't help shifting away from a car centric culture so um ev are politically convenient because they do look like they're pointing in the right direction and are but they should be um, like the waste triangle. They should be the last thing you do. So travel less, travel active, travel public. And if there's anything left over, um, travel electric with what's left. Yeah, um, thank you. Uh, and in terms of electrifying buses, it's good because they're quieter. Um, but in most of the areas I've looked at, bus emissions are a rounding error on the total game. So they're, again, they're, they're one that to watch out for because they can be used for as a political story of action whilst actually avoiding the changes that the system level changes that are needed to actually drive emissions down. They're not bad, but they can be used as a smokescreen. Well, well you mentioned that your um, little um, model had, <clears throat> had been done for Wellington, but also this region. How can we access that? So um, if you type into Google, um, transport 2035. <laughs> so this work was finally picked up by um, Waka Kotahi. They couldn't cope with the idea of 2030. It was way too close. Mm -hmm. So they turned it into the uh, transport 2035 model. And there are a whole bunch of towns, including Marlborough, Nelson, Tasman. I have not used it um, for the region, but it is in substance the same tool as the one that we've been using for the last three years. And so I think that it's, and it's also done by Anna Cagney. Um, I think it'd be wonderful if people got comfortable with scenarios that are aligned with uh, the sort of emissions reductions we're talking about. Talk, talk about 80% less petrol diesel by 2030 as a target. And then what do you need to believe in order for that to happen? Cool, thank you. Um... We got any more? Um, I'll just put that in the chat anyway, so just save you the Google search. Thank you. Robin, oh, Robin you're muted. Um, 
question about council regulating that against large vehicles in the city centre, whether that's SUVs or, you know, your twin cab utes and so forth. Mm. Any experience with that? It's politically fraught. Um, I mean, the, the Hilux or Ranger Man, as um, it's described by some of the media, is, is definitely a, a political cohort. That said, those vehicles are very, very high emissions. And the emissions uh, standards that have been come in, that have come in, are making them much, much less favourable. Um, like they're putting a lot of additional cost on them and they're driving them down. Um, what we haven't yet seen is any serious uh, any serious questioning of the scale of these vehicles on the road. I mean, that, that from a health perspective, they're incredibly safe for the people inside and incredibly dangerous for anybody who's not inside. Um, so it's it's a bit surprising that that hasn't been questioned more seriously yet. But that would be the next frontier, I'd hope, would come to play. And it's really, I think, the health sector. Um, unfortunately, has not been anywhere near as vocal as they might be. Um, not that they don't buy this, but uh, what I've observed is that many, in particular under what used to be the DHBs, are effectively muzzled, so they're not allowed to speak out um, at all. And so you have one of the most important voices, the doctors and the public health physicians of our country, are effectively silenced. Um, so giving them licence um, to speak would be wonderful. Uh, perhaps a, a final comment, if you could, on the, the role of rail and shipping. Um, there used to be a rail link to Wakatu Nelson, but is no longer. Mm. We lobby for these things. If you, I think rail, this is a, this is a, it's a challenging question. If you believe that there is a need for us to make the change as quickly as I've argued, if you don't already have a track in place, it's really hard to, to, to move the dial on the timeline that we need. So it's not that rail is not a great tool, and you know we've seen it all around the world, it's great. It's just it takes too long to roll out. Um, so we should have rail, it should be, well, we do have rail, rather, it should be full. Um, but that's a lot, I think that's a longer term game. It's a longer game to shift to, and particularly between the cities. Within the cities is, I mean, within Auckland, for example, it's pretty expensive putting a new track down. Mm. And it's very and it's very carbon intensive using there's a lot of concrete and steel goes into those projects. Um so, so what about coastal shipping? Because like one thing with coastal shipping and flying actually is that there's no infrastructure between the endpoints. Um and they're quite resilient to um, climate change um, weather. Yep. Yep. Yeah, so, uh, so flying is an interesting one because the emissions per kilometre are actually better in a plane than they're in a car. Like if you had to get to Wellington, you're better off taking a plane than a car. But um, that's unfortunately a relatively small amount of our total emissions mix in New Zealand. Um, the In terms of shipping, um, there's, I mean, there's shipping freight. There's definitely, there's absolutely a resilience story to be built there. Um, and I think that's probably the angle. I think one of the things that's come out in the work we've been doing is, you know, I come out guns blazing, banging on about carbon and climate and all this stuff, but a lot of people care more about, about equity or they care more about cost or they care about other things. And in Auckland, one of the things they care a lot about is congestion because it's just getting worse and worse and worse. And as the population grows, it'll just carry on getting worse and worse. And in fact, any urban landscape that sprawls will do the same thing. I think the lever for shipping will probably be be resilience. If we look at uh, Tarafiti and Hawke's Bay over the last three, four months, they've been effectively cut off. Um, so that comes in and, and allows you to um, to move things around. Uh, the, the, the challenge you have with moving things uh, by ship from an emission standards, in many cases, it requires a truck roll at either end. So you end up with a high handling cost in trucks. So whenever I've tried to make the maths of that work, it just doesn't look like it moves the dial that much. Well, uh, we're on time uh, with apologies to people whose questions we haven't got to, but we'll find another way of um, managing that. 
so I would like to thank you, Paul, for updating us on the, the current critical situation in no uncertain terms and highlighting the, the best ways to decarbonise transport. There's certainly plenty there for us all to work on. And thank you, Jane, also uh, you know, for the work that you're doing and to Drew on the uh, NCC. Uh, I'd just like to give you a brief reminder about um, the upcoming climate action transport events this week. We've got the electric Bike Expo on Wednesday at Rutherford Park from 10 to 2. Thursday, we've got the webinar, Take the Jump, uh, which includes transport, of course, Travel Fresh. And on Saturday, an electric vehicle expo at uh, Saxton Field from 10 to 12. So it's plenty to learn through the week. And Hand over to you, Joanna. Thank you. Right. I, I will end with a karakia. And this karakia is based on a metaphor of zero emissions transport, uh, namely awaka. The, the metaphor <laughs> is that we've, we've been out on, on the ocean in awaka together paddling in unison, and now, now we've come to the shore at the end of our journey. Uh, and we're celebrating uh, being together and the ocean and the night. Ko te ha, ko te ra, ko te pō, ko tangaroa, ko te mana, ko te kotahitanga o ngā matāwaka. Aumie, Ooh, yeah. Thai, yeah.